Um, my name is Hector Carrada Bravo. I'm at the Center for Computational Biology, uh, Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology at the University of Maryland. Um, I've been working uh, mostly on kind of statistical methods for um, analysis of metagenomic um, data, and, um, and, 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 and more recently on kind of visualization methods for these, these data sets, and I'll hopefully talk about both. So um, the, the day I interviewed for my job, my colleague Mihai Pop, who's also in the audience, told me about this study. Um, and here we are. So um, <laughs> this, uh, this is a, a, a fairly large um, study. Uh, it, it's a lot of the funding comes from the Gates Foundation. And it's a, a pretty large cohort of um, childhood um, of, of children in the developing uh, country, and in particular, um, one data set that, that, that we started um, studying is uh, roughly 1,000 stool samples uh, for children under five uh, years of age, um, some of which um, had shown um, uh, moderate to severe diarrhea at some point um, before the, the study and controls that had shown no, no such um, phenotype. Um, the results of that um, uh, study of, of this particular cohort were published in Genome Biology um, last year. And um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's really quite a wonderful cohort and quite a wonderful study. And we, we wanted to ask questions of how does uh, composition of the microbiota differ by site? By site, we mean like geographically and by age. Um, how does composition differ in, in children with di diarrheal di uh, disturbance? And can we identify specific bacterial species associated with um, presenting symptoms of diarrhea? So as I said, it's, a, it's really quite a, a, a lovely study. It's a, um, had four sites, um, in three in Africa, one in Southeast Asia, in the Gambia, Mali, Kenya, and Bangladesh. Um, pretty relatively well designed as far as we can um, tell in terms of cases and controls um, geographically and in terms of that um, outcome, and also in terms of uh, groupings of, in, in terms of age, um, both case and, and disease. So um, it was a pretty convincing argument to get me to work on it. So, um, so the, uh, the, the, the pipeline that we used to analyze this data set, and, and I, I, I kind of bring this up because a lot of what I'll talk about in terms of the statistics may be conditioned on, well, definitely conditioned on that and the generality of that. Um, uh, I'll let you think about how that applies. But um, what we did was um, essentially we had about 4 million, uh, 3.5 million reads in total, about 3.6 reads per sample. Um, and we used a binning approach uh, developed by, uh, by, by people in the, in, in the group, uh, Mihai's group, um, to cluster um, um, sequences, 16S sequences, into um, um, just OTUs. All right? And um, identified 783 distinct stands uh, type from 165 genera. But about 26,000 OTUs, um, in roughly in that, in that count. And um, some of the results that, that, that we find in, in general would be um, how diversity um, changes through, through age. Um, there's an increase in diversity, both in cases and control, but roughly um, a slightly higher diversity, in, well, no, a higher diversity in controls through age um, um, compared to cases, so diarrhea versus non-diarrhea. And that, that trend seemed to be more or less um, um, reflected in all sites independent of geography. And of course, what we wanted to do was identify specific bacterial um, species were the, the, uh, associated with diarrhea, and, and we did this with a battery of statistical methods uh, so, uh, testing the association of OTUs with disease, both in present substance and then also in statistics based on abundance, and that's what I'll, I'll concentrate on uh, for the rest of the, of the talk. Um, and you know, and our, ideally what we wanted to do was identify possible um, species that could be um, targeted through interventions, and, and, and it looks like in follow-up work, we'll be able to, to show some of this. So, right, I'm, I'm, I, I came through a, a background of statistics, and, um, and, and, and I said, you know, this is a wonderfully designed study. 
started looking at data and said, uh, not quite so pretty anymore. All right, so um, we decided to, um, you know, I, I, I had been working on transcriptomics before and all those things. I knew how those things worked and realized that a lot of what we had learned in that space didn't quite translate to this type of study. Um, and in fact, um, the more complex the study design, the less suitable those methods are. So what is the complexity, I think, in this particular study design? It's the heterogeneity geographically of, what, of the samples that we're seeing. Um, and also the wide variety in our ability to sequence those communities per sample. And, and I'll show you more, more about those. So um, kind of trying to address some of those concerns, we came up with specific statistical methods um, that we then published in Nature Methods um, last year as well. Um, and um, we release a uh, software in R and Bioconductor, and I'll give you pointers to that in a second. So, um, so for now on, I'll, 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 I'll give you the requisite statistician matrix um, slide. Um, what I'll be talking about is uh, a, a data set that looks like this, where rows in this case are OTUs, or species, or general, whichever um, uh, level that you're thinking about, but we'll We'll spend most of the time talking about OTUs, and, and columns in this matrix are samples. It's the number of reads that we observe for that particular sample for that particular OTU. Okay. And in the question of identifying um, features or OTUs that are associated with bacteria, you know, we're trying to test this um, hypothesis that um, there is no difference between case and control and, and the alternative that there is. So, what made me think that we needed some new software and a paper to describe that? Um, I do think that there are things that are, that are specific to this type of analysis that do distinguish it from, say, other count-based, uh, sequence-based methods like RNA-seq, for example. And I think the biggest one is this one. We really don't have a good handle of what the features are going to be when we do our test, right? Unless you make some very large simplifying assumptions. We're only going to look at genus or, for example, or specific species in a database. But as I said, the features of that matrix, the rows of that matrix, come on from binning sequences. Right? Every time, every cluster that we go through, our, 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 that, that is output by our binning algorithm, becomes a feature in our matrix over which we're going to do our statistical tests. That extra degree of freedom of our somewhat arbitrarily growing that matrix um, is not common. Right? That's, that's not used very frequently, or, or that's not something that we see very frequently in this type of count-based statistical methods. And the data is very sparse, and some of that may be the result of being able to, in some way, um, increase the number of features that we can, that we can use, but also is, it may be the result of, as I said, heterogeneity of this study, right? It might be that certain OTUs are found in certain geographical regions and not in other geographic regions. There might be something about the heterogeneity of the population that we're studying um, in terms of, say, host genetics, for example, that um, preclude certain species of or certain OTUs of appearing on all these things. So um, that turned out to be a, 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 a fairly uh, difficult problem to, to, to deal with. And of course, the varying depth of coverage um, something that is kind of hard to control in, the, in, a, in an epidemiological study of this size. Um, another um, important thing that, that we wanted to, to address was the fact that there's heterogeneity in the, in the study design in terms of the geographical size, the population that we're seeing. And something that, that we uh, did try to address this, I think we'll have, um, is relevant to discussions on how to, say, for example, combine data sets that come from different labs or data sets that come from different um, technologies and uh, so forth. So um, the first plot I made on this data set, that was the plot that you know, made me scratch my head about accepting the job to actually work on this thing, was this plot. All right? It's the number of features detected um, versus the sequencing depth. So this is human HMP project, right? So it's rarefaction, it's just a standard um, um, rarefaction curve, but has some pretty significant, um, 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 you know, results when, when we're trying to do our testing. 
Um, so this would be another data set. This is a, a, a data set looking just as long um, in, 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 in human subjects. And again, sequencing death, still a linear. Yes. So what, what we had hoped to see was this, of course, at low sequencing rates, uh, you would see this trend, but at some point, if you have a high enough sequencing, this will plateau and say, well, I have seen representative um, samples of, of what I'll, I'll see in the community. The, uh, the, the fact that this is not happening, um, first of all, uh, uh, indicates some things that we might want to think about. Um, how long will this go before it plateaus? And the longer that goes, um, makes us question, well, how valid is it to treat this data as compositional? And meaning, can we constrain, should we really be constraining the behavior of these measurements in a compositional way? Um, you know, once, once we have uh, a, a, a deep enough uh, or a good enough representation of what the possible players in the communities are, I think that's a more valid um, approach. Um, and the second one is, um, as we are um, testing for differences in, co in, 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 say, cases versus controls, we want to make sure that we take into account the p difference in probability of having actually observed the count for a particular sample based on this uh, difference in um, sequencing rate. So, uh, and, and why did, did, did we want to address this? If I make the same plot for kind of RNA-seq studies, we don't see the same strong trend, all right? So, um, so we decided to, to, to try to address this, and the way we address this is is this question of how, how can I model the behavior of um, presence, absence as a function of depth of coverage, and how do I then correct our um, distribution of, of counts to address that? So when, whenever we see this, we, as statisticians, we need to you know, quickly think of mixture models that try to combine um, a component that says what is the probability that I detect of um, a feature for a given sample um, based on the sample sequence, um, sequencing rate or depth of coverage, and an actual abundance distribution that describes the underlying population um, of that OTU in, the, in our samples. And the way we did it, um, we assumed that that um, distribution, that count distribution, um, its mean can be described by a linear model that includes, say, for example, case control indicators, and also um, a parameter that uh, depends on, uh, on scaling factor um, to deal with other feature-specific biases. Um, and this model, as long as you have the right samples and the right design, can be extended to include other things like geography or um, age or other um, covariates that we wanted to include in a large hetero uh, heterogeneous epidemiological study. And lastly, this probability of detection, as I said, is uh, we, we treat it as a function of sequencing depth, um, again, using a linear model. And this can be as, uh, a model that's dependent on different um, community types. So for example, lung versus um, gut versus um, skin. So what is the, what is the effect of this? Um, essentially, what we, we found is that we tended to moderate differences between groups when there is a, um, uh, um, some kind of relationship between the probability of absence and, um, and sequencing depth in a particular group. So what we tended to do was moderate um, some of that difference uh, in statistics. Um, and and, and I, uh, I'll refer you to our Nature Methods paper to describe how, how that compares to, to other standard count-based uh, methods, say, for example, DEC that's used in in um, an RNA-seq uh, consistently, what we find is that this sparsity problem, it, it really is problematic for estimates of dispersion in those models, which then leads to problems in, in downstream inferences. So um, our uh, statistical method um, is implemented in this package in Metagenome Seq in our bioconductor. Um, I think Besides the statistical model, what is really ni uh, nice about this package is just a general way of managing metagenomic data in R and Bioconductor. We have um, ways of, um, uh, of doing the, star the standard type of operations that we want to do in these um, data sets that are not 
you know, standard in other account-based, uh, so something as simple as aggregating to particular taxonomic levels. Um, our data for this particular study is also available in Bioconductor, so you can play around with, with that. And so we find it very helpful for development of um, statistical methods. So um, from this study, I would say that the best practices that we've learned from for uh, 16S uh, um, analysis is in terms of normalization, um, avoid total sum scaling. And I'll give you another um, um, example of that for whole metagenome sequencing. Um, uh, DSeq um, or our own CSS, which I'll describe shortly, tend to do a little bit better. Um, in terms of testing, PhiloSeq is another uh, our bioconductor package, which works, works very well for small to moderate sample size, where rarefaction effects are not that large or that strong. And I would recommend that we, you know, try our our, our our, our package when you have fairly large heterogeneous samples, um, large sample sizes, and where rarefaction effects are strong. So um, what we uh, wanted to do next was uh, study our, uh, um, how applicable or, or how um, our observations um, transfer to uh, analysis of whole metagenomic sequences. And in particular, we look at uh, a data set uh, for type 2 diabetics, um, where now um, uh, features are based on mapping to a gene catalog. Um, what we find is, um, yeah, so again, we have the same matrix, but now rows in this are gene clusters, and the number of times reads map to this gene cluster, and we used, um, say, for example, bow tie. Um, what we find is, again, sparsity is still an issue in these kind of large data sets, regardless of how you perform that mapping. If you only um, if you assign um, reads that map to multiple features at random or just to one um, feature, um, we find that you know, on, uh, the median uh, proportion of zeros in a sample is still roughly under 75 percentage. Um, the minimum is still roughly under 76. So, um, still very, very sparse and still um, find this rarefaction effect in, in, in most of our, our methods. So um, something we wanted to, to study was, um, again, this question of, of, of normalization and scaling. Um, you can think of um, treating these data as proportions where we divide um, counts by the sum of the counts for a given sample as a way of scaling by <coughs> an estimate of your sampling rate. In this case, your estimate of sampling rate is the total number of sequences that you uh, obtain. Um, on our Nature Methods paper, we defined uh, a cumulative sum scaling, which is essentially the same idea, except that you don't add all the counts in a given sample. You stop at a given um, quantile that we believe behaves better um, across uh, different samples. So we wanted to ask this question. It's like all of what we're doing is um, estimating sampling rates for each sample. Um, um, how good are different estimates of sampling rate, including the total number of reads that you obtain for a given sample? Um, so this is an unknown um, actual sampling rate. You know, how good are you at capturing reads from a given community um, and sequencing them? And these are estimates um, f of, of that sampling rate, including, say, the total number of reads that you obtain or our own um, cumulative sum uh, scaling. And we wanted to ask this question, well, suppose that there are a number of uh, features that should not, you know, don't change too much in these data sets. Well, what we'd expect to see is the bigger the sampling rate um, across samples, the, num the, feature, the number of reads that you observe across samples for a given feature should also increase, right? The more sequences you observe, the more you sample in, uh, according to your sampling rate, the more counts you see um, for a given um, feature. And then we looked at the distribution of that across um, features. And say, for example, this is what you do, this is what you get when you do uh, total sum scaling. So this is how well correlated are the ranks of the total number of reads versus the counts for each feature um, across, um, across um, features. And we see most of everything is essentially zero correlated, right? There are a few small number of features that are highly correlated. Most everything is um, low correlation. Um, we find that, again, DE6 and our own um, 
correlation um, um, sampling rate estimates tend to behave better, and that the sampling rate estimates are uh, dependent on, on sparsity of the features. As we see, total sum scaling, essentially, it's uncorrelated completely, regardless of the number of samples that we have. Um, D, seek, our, our, and our methods, um, correlation is improved as you obtain more sequences. And in summary, I think all of these linear scaling methods are wrong for metagenomics data. Let's get used to that fact and get comfortable with that. Um, we'll, we're trying to do better. We'll, we, we think we have some solutions, and we'll try to um, tell you what those are soon. Um, something that we also did um, recently, and it's part of um, Metagenome Seq2, is, is we, we're starting to use regularization methods to stabilize our estimates. Um, we find that our estimates are rather unstable, depending on the number of positive samples. So we have um, shrinkage to kind of control um, this, or stabilize our estimates when you have a small number of positive samples in features. So essentially, we don't do any changes. So this is the difference in our estimates when we apply regularization versus not. Um, if you have high number of positive samples in a feature, we don't do anything. The smaller number of features that we do, we tend to um, control um, the size of those um, 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 differences. And anecdotally, so suppose we use our method uh, to, as feature selection, um, we can improve a random forest uh, prediction of type 1 diabetes on this data set to an AUC of 95 compared to an AUC of 81 as published in that paper. So moving forward, um, what are we uh, working on? Um, as I said, uh, I, I think a, a, an important part of what we have in our software, uh, besides our statistical models, is an infrastructure for dealing with metagenomic data. And part of what we want to do is stabilize a feature annotation infrastructure for that. And we're starting with 16S. Um, if you get into the bioconductor community, we'll be asking for comments and requests on, on, on how you might want to see that um, soon. Um, we're also working on spy-based models for longitudinal analysis. That implementation is also in metagenome, so you can try it out and let us know how you, how you work. And of course, the big elephant in the room is that all these features are correlated. For example, compositionality is one way of inducing correlation between features, but now we think we're not exactly sure that that's applicable. So um, we want to do a little bit better when testing um, both um, marginal models under correlation, but also starting to think about um, testing for in terms of community statistics. So, you know, a straightforward way is to use empirical estimates of covariance of correlation, adjust marginal models, and what I think is the beautiful but harder way is can we model of some aspects of community assembly rules? Where is, um, are things um, anti-correlated because they, they, they are exclusive in, in what kind of role they play in the, in the community? Are things highly correlated because they are um, both serving the same role or not? Um, I think we can model, we can try to model some community assembly rules and use those to build multivariate models, which leads me to believe that <coughs> this idea of one model fits all types of communities is also wrong because some communities are under a certain assembly rules and other communities under other different assembly rules and we perhaps shouldn't be treating the statistical models that we build for one community versus the other one in the same way. And of course, the, uh, the thing that I, uh, I, I, I we've been working on is um, visualization, um, how to effectively navigate large data sets where features are organized hierarchically, and we're building prototype um, visualization methods for that. And all right, so um, this is one example of what we're doing. Um, what we're working on is a, a, a method of kind of navigating through hierarchies using this type of visualization and linking the, that visualization to uh, measurements um, that we're observing in data. So this is our representation of a, bi a phylogenetic tree. This is for, again, 16S data. Um, what we are trying to do here is, is um, represent that hierarchical organization of these um, samples, the features, um, according to that, um, and then uh, linking um, our, um, you know, locations in this tree to uh, measurements that we observe. So again, this is the same uh, data set that we had. This is now our samples organized by age um, and, and clustered by, um, say, uh, 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 this particular level of the, of the hierarchy. Um, you can, uh, on the fly, aggregate um, different levels of the subtree. So for example, if we switch this and we click here, you can then aggregate all features under this node of the tree into a single measurement so that all the data that you observe is aggregated to that. 
You can um, remove parts of the tree that you don't want to see in this data set. So we're treating this representation as a way of navigating through a complex feature set and then being able to uh, describe more complex relationships in the data and the quantitative data itself um, here. And of course, this type of organization is not restricted to hierarchical features or OTUs. Our data sets are other, can also be hierarchically um, organized. So for example, this is a time series data for one particular um, uh, mouse where you have one diet here and a different diet there. And we can again summarize all measurements for a particular day. Um, um, you can aggregate to that. You can do um, the kind of ordination plots that you would like to do um, uh, um, regularly, and you can highlight different samples along this hierarchical organization of the samples themselves um, in this data set. So all of this will be uh, uh, um, um, part of our infrastructure in Metagenome Seek. I, I, I invite you to, to try it out and use it. I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, two graduate students who've been working on this, Joseph Falson, who did a lot of the work in Metagenome Seek. He's now a postdoc at Harvard. Florin Cellaro, who's been working on the visualization stuff, is now a har postdoc at MIT, and Mihai Pop, uh, he's still at UMD, um, luckily for me. So, um, I'll take questions. Uh, great talk. Um, so the one thing you didn't sort of talk about, though, in 16S data is that people tend to still just subsample, right, down to the sort of lowest yeah, don't. number of reads that they're comfortable with, mm -hmm. which assumes, obviously, the, the bad side of that is you're throwing away data. The good side is, though, that you're assuming no linear scaling model at all. Um, I was wondering if you could comment about that and about why you're not doing that comparison in, in so some papers. So <coughs> the reason why, why I think we're, I mean, we, we us and others have made that comparison of rarefaction versus non rarefaction right? Um, um, so the, the plot that I showed um, looking at preferential sampling across the range that's not linear will tell me never to do rarefaction anymore because rarefaction is assuming that the behavior that as you remove um, reads, you're, you're, uni you're equally likely you're, or you're removing reads at the proportion at which they would be sampled uh, the deeper you go in sequencing, all right? So that be deviation from that behavior indicates that even if, even if, if, if it's a problem in terms of increasing variability at the marginal model in terms of, of, of read coverage, the more variance, the, the, the fewer reads, the more variance, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's just an invalid way of modeling the way sequencing bias works across features. So I just would not recommend it in general. So uh, yeah, so his question is, um, so suppose you don't want to throw away data, but you want to increase the data for, for small sequence. Uh, so for samples, I have small sequencing depths to complement that. Um, yes, as long as you don't do um, um, all the samples in one group only. Right. You make sure your balance in design is still there in some way. You know, I don't want you to rerun the entire thing, but you try to keep the balance that you had in your uh, experimental design as much as you can. And second, using the linear model approach that we have, you can try to control for certain batch effects that will come from that. <laughs>